my mic, so there it is. Okay, good morning. If I go ahead and have a seat and make someone around you feel welcome. Uh, my name is Jesse Belton. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm our student pastor here at Connection Church, and I get a chance to preach every once and again. And, and uh, so today I am continuing our series that Richie has entitled New Me in 23. And so uh, if you're a guest with us, man, we're glad you're here. Thank you for taking the time to come and join uh, us on this Sunday morning. Uh, I pray that this time would be fruitful for you, uh, and I pray that you would feel welcome while you're here. Uh, two things for you. Uh, there's going to be a gift for you as you leave, and so we've got some bags to give to you. And so somebody's going to be looking for you in the lobby to hand that to you, so be on the lookout for it as you leave. Second thing is we've got a QR code on the seat back in front of you, and that'll take you to our digital connect card. And so if you'll scan that, it'll let us know you're here, and it'll give us an opportunity to reach out to you and pray for you uh, and see how we can serve you. So thank you again, guests, for being here. Uh, like I said, uh, we started this series last week called New Me in 23, uh, and, and it's all about how we can be better, not, not just better physically or mentally, uh, but better spiritually, how we can better serve the Lord. Uh, if you remember last week, Richie talked about spiritual disciplines as means, not ends. Uh, they're, they're means, not ends. In the end, the end goal is to be more like Christ. And so there's different things we can do to become more like Christ. Uh, he, he preached last week, Richie did, from 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I'm going to read it again, as this will kind of be the hinge point for all the messages in this series. It says, but have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train yourself in godliness. For the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. And, 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 and as we think through how we train our life to come, how we train in godliness, there is no way that we can train better than by digging into the word of God. It is the number one way that we are going to become more godly because it is how God communicates to us. And so today we're going to be looking at what it means to intake Bible, what it means to study the Bible and meditate and read and learn from God. Uh, to study the Bible, like I said, there, there is no other way for us to grow in godliness as efficiently and as quickly as understanding the word that he gave for us. If you want to hear from God, you have to open your Bible. If you want God to speak to you, if you want to depend on his strength in all the situations throughout your life, if you want him to carry you through even the most difficult times, you have to open your Bible. It, it's that simple. God chose this book as the way that he communicates with us. He could have chose any way to communicate with us, right? But instead, he chose this book. He, he could have done anything else, but he preserved this volume of 66 books that was written by over 30 different men over a span of uh, at least 1,400 years on three different continents. All of these books in this book, though, have one central theme. It's a central theme of a God who loves you and a God who wants best for you, a God who deserves our glory and our honor, and it all points to Jesus. And, and this is how God communicates to you and to me. Uh, if you want to know God, you have to know his word. It's that simple. Uh, in the beginning of the Gospel of John, John 1.1, 1, 1, he wrote, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This, it, this, this, this tells us that this book in its very essence, it is God. It, it has what God has for us. He has chosen the word as his means of communicating. That is why this is so important. This is so important that we study the word and that, that, you, that you understand the depth and the breadth of the word uh, is because this is, in essence, the Lord. It is the way that he communicates with us. Again, John 1, 1 says, the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus himself is the word, and this story tells us all about him. So today, we're going to be in Psalm 119. If you know much about the Bible, you know this is the longest chapter in the Bible. And, and I, was, I was planning on, if I didn't want to really sermon prep as much, I could just read the entire thing. It takes about 15 minutes to read it, but I'm not going to do that. Don't worry. Uh, we're only going to read uh, a few sections of this psalm. But if you want to get to Psalm 119, we're going to be starting in verse 89. Uh, so the Psalm 119 is an acrostic poem, and uh, if you look at it, and if you know what it means to be an acrostic poem, you're going to say, no, it's not, uh, because it's not in the English language. But in the original Hebrew language, this is an acrostic poem, so the writer of this psalm took each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet 
and wrote eight verses that started with each letter. And so if we were going to do that, we would write eight verses with A and eight verses with B and eight verses with C and so on and so forth. And he did it with the Hebrew alphabet. And throughout this psalm, the entire psalm, the entire theme of what he wrote is the, the joy that's found and the love that's found and the appreciation that we should have for God's word. Uh, in this psalm, there are eight different words that are used synonymously for the word of God. There's law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, ordinances, word, and promise. And the interesting thing is at least one of those eight words is found in nearly every single verse. There's 176 verses in this psalm, and, and one of those words for law is found in nearly every verse. It is the central theme of this massive poem that was written. Uh, the importance of God's word is, is so clear as we read through this psalm. And, and so there's three things that we're going to pull from this psalm. Uh, and, 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 and as we go through and read the, the verses that we're going to read, I want you to think about this. We're going to see what God's word is. We're going to see what we gain from reading his word. And then we're going to see how we can faithfully submit our lives to his word. And so we're going to read from 89 to 112. And so there's three sections that we're going to go through. And, and, and as I searched this psalm, I found that these were the most, the most fruitful sections for me. And so I hope they are for you as well. And we're going to read through them, and then we're going to talk about them. And then we're going to talk about how we can better study this word at the end. Okay, let's jump in. So Psalm 119, starting in verse 89, we're going to read through verse 96. It says, Lord, your word is forever. It is firmly fixed in heaven. Your faithfulness is for all generations. You established the earth, and it stands firm. Your judgments stand firm today, for all things are your servants. If your instructions had not been my delight, I would have died in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for you have given me life through them. I am yours. Save me, for I have studied your precepts. The wicked hope to destroy me, but I contemplate your decrees. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your command is without limit. This psalm tells us, or this section of this psalm tells us many things. And the first thing is that the Lord's word is forever. It is enduring, it is, it is constant, and it is forever. This story of our Lord is forever. The stories within it, the, the narrative, the parables, the poems, the, the prophecies, the letters written, they are timeless truths that speak to every generation. Yes, they were written for a purpose, right? The writer of this psalm wrote this psalm to someone, but he also wrote it to us. Paul wrote the book of Romans, right? He wrote it to the church in Rome, but he also wrote it for us and every other generation that has ever lived uh, past the time that he wrote that. These, these words that are written in this book last forever. It, it tells us that the same God who created and established the earth, the same God who, who when you go outside at night and see the vast stars, the same God who created you and me and knit us together in our mother's womb, he gave us this word. This isn't just some words written on a page from some guy. This is the creator of the universe communicating to me and to you. Even today, as the world looks much different than it did when these books were written, right? right? Genesis, uh, Moses wrote Genesis about 3,500 years ago, right? It was a little different back then than it is today, yet we can still open this book and, and gain so much truth from it. His word is enduring. It is, it is true, and it is faithful through all generations. The word is something that we should use to guide us. We see that in this section. It says, if your instruction was not my delight, I would have died in affliction. This word is to guide us. And we're going to dig deeper into that in a few minutes uh, on another section. But another thing we see in this, this first part in verse 95, it says, the wicked hope to destroy me, but I contemplate your decrees. The word of God is what we lean on when the enemy seeks to destroy us. And this is modeled perfectly for us. Uh, this, this idea of leaning on the word when the enemy seeks to destroy us. Jesus did this perfectly. And we can, we can look at that and, and see how we can follow his example. You don't have to turn there. Uh, but in Matthew chapter 4. So this is after Jesus has been baptized. And he takes 
uh, a moment to go out into the wilderness. And, and a moment, I say, is not necessarily accurate because he was there for 40 days. And Jesus fasts for 40 days in the wilderness. And when he's there on the 40th day, he's almost done. And Satan himself comes to Jesus to tempt Jesus. In verse 3 of chapter 4, Matthew, Satan speaking, it says, Then the tempter approached him and said, If you were the Son of God, tell the stones to become bread. Right? He says, If you really are the Son of God and you've really fasted for 40 days, I bet you're pretty hungry. Uh, so why don't you just turn that stone into bread? And Jesus looks at him. And he says, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus didn't submit to his humanness and say, yeah, I'm starving. I haven't eaten in 40 days. And he didn't turn that rock into bread. Instead, he depended on the word of God. He did what Psalm 119 tells us. And when, when the enemy came to destroy, he contemplated God's decrees. He said, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God's mouth. It continues on, and Satan continues to try to tempt him. Satan says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels orders according to you. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus told him, it is written, do not test the Lord your God. There's a lot of, of important things we can pull from just that. First thing is that Satan knows the word of God. And so... One big point that we're going to see today, it's not just enough to know this word and to read this word. We have to study it and meditate on it, right? We have to apply it to our lives because the devil himself knows this word and he used it to try and tempt Jesus. He said, if you jump off, God's going to save you. It says in the word that the angels will come concerning you and they won't let you be bruised. But Jesus says, it also says, don't test the Lord your God. Just because I know he will doesn't mean I have to ask him to. He goes on one more time. And Satan says to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Satan says, I'll give you everything you've ever desired if you just worship me. Jesus, again, when, when he's tempted by the wicked, he contemplates the decrees of God. And he thinks in his head and he says, no, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And so Jesus didn't, didn't, didn't take the temptation uh, from Satan. Jesus didn't fall to temptation. Why? Not only because he is God, because he was also 100% man. He had just as much inclination to sin as you and I did because he was fully human, yet he chose in his humanness to depend on God. He chose in his humanness to look back on the decrees of the Lord and say, Satan, you say this, but God said this. So as Jesus did, we too are instructed by the psalm, the wicked hope to destroy me, but I contemplate your decrees. When evil comes, when hate comes, when hurt and, and, and difficulties come, we lean on the word of God. One more thing in this section, verse 96. This is a beautiful verse. It says, I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your command is without limit. And if you know the Bible well, you know Ecclesiastes, uh, this uh, one commentary I read said that this could well be a summary of Ecclesiastes, where every earthly enterprise has its day and comes to nothing, only God and his commands uh, will not have these frustrating limits. And so everything we seek for, everything we try to do, everything that we strive for fails. Like every single worldly pursuit fails. Because every single worldly pursuit is exactly that. It's worldly. But God's word never fails. And that's what the psalm tells us. I've seen a limit to all perfection, but your command is without limit. There is no limit to the perfection of God, and his word shows us that. Okay, let's read on and, and continue on in Psalm 119. Verse 97, uh, we're going to read this next section here. It says, how I love your instructions. It is my meditation all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, because your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the elders, because I obey your precepts. I have kept your feet from every evil path to follow your word. I have not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed me how sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every false way. 
Again, let's, let's pick through and, and see what exactly it is the psalmist is writing to us. We are called in, in, in this. He says, I love your instructions. It's my meditation all day long. We are called to meditate on God's word. And when we do, we develop a deep love for it. Right? This psalmist clearly loves God's word. He wrote 176 verses about God's word. You don't just develop that type of a love for something by not studying it, by not spending your life devouring it and, and pursuing it. The psalmist has spent his life reading God's word and understanding God's word and seeking to apply it to his life. And because he's done that, he's developed a deep love for it. And we're called to do the same thing. I love your instruction. It's my meditation all the day, the day long. If we, if we meditate on God's word daily, every single day, all day, if our minds are engrossed with the word of God, we will grow to love the word of God. And when we love it and when we study it that way, it tells us in the psalm that, that, that we grow to understand it. We grow to have a knowledge that surpasses that, first of our enemies, surpasses that of our teachers, and surpasses that of the elders. There is not a scholar in this world who would have more knowledge than you if you would devote your life to studying this book. That's what the Psalms tells us. Often it can feel intimidating to read God's word. I get it. I understand. Like there's a lot of stuff in here that's hard to understand. It's, it's hard. Like there's some things you read in the Bible and you're like, that's in the Bible? Like there's some things that you read the Bible and you're like scratching your head like, I don't get it. But God promises us, he tells us in his word that if we study it, we will gain insight greater than all the teachers of the world. Listen, I've been uh, studying theology deeply for two and a half years now. I've been in seminary for two and a half years, and I can tell you there is no substitute for reading this. There is no theology textbook. There is no professor. There is no one in the world. There's nothing in the world that is more valuable than studying God's word. They, 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 people study it and they, and, and they try to intake it and, and they try to communicate to us what it is, but there's something lost when we're not the ones studying it. Like, no matter who you're talking about, the greatest, most intelligent scholar in the world, they have no more access to God than you do. This is all we all have, and it's enough, it's sufficient, it's plenty, and, and you too can have the greatest understanding of God's word if we just study God's word. That's what it tells us. He tells us in the psalm, I have more insight than all of my teachers because of your decrees or my meditation. Because I study your word and I apply your word to my life and I spend my life focusing on your word. I have more knowledge than my teachers. I understand more than the elders because I obey your precepts. I use this word and I understand it and I study it and I apply it to my life and I do it. And when you do that, you can have more knowledge than literally anyone else. That's what God's word tells us. So when we develop this deep love for God's word, we begin to desire his word. We begin to desire him and not evil. We begin to desire him and walk towards him rather than towards the world. The sweetness of God's word, it tells us that how sweet is your word, how, how sweet it is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. And, and, and that, that sweetness of God's word, I think we can all attest to this. I can attest to this. It's an acquired taste, right? The first time, if you just open your Bible and start reading, it may not be that sweet the first time because there's a lot of things in here that, that are hard to stomach when you don't follow Christ, when you don't trust Christ, when you don't believe that, that God is for you and that he loves you and he wants what's best for you. If we just open this word, there is a lot of rebuke in here for worldliness. There is a lot of things in this word that, that if we're of the world aren't going to sound right to us, aren't going to seem sweet to us. But if we devour it and if we, if we completely give ourselves over to studying the word, it becomes sweet and it is sweeter than honey. We can draw on his guidance. Uh, a scholar that, that wrote a book uh, all about spiritual disciplines, uh, he says that his name's Donald Whitney. He said, when scripture is stored in your mind, it is available for the Holy Spirit to bring to your attention when you need it the most. And so when we, when we, when we study this word and it becomes sweet to us and we devour it and it's within our hearts, uh, we, we then have ammunition 
right? We have something that when the Holy Spirit convicts us or when the Holy Spirit guides us, he pulls these things to our mind. And that sweetness of God's word, we are reminded of it and we are able to use it as we navigate our lives. I promise you this. It says, I gain understanding from the precepts. Therefore, I hate every false way. I promise you this, that when we, when we study God's word, we, we develop this deep love for it and we begin to see that there is nothing too difficult for us in life when we depend on his word. There is nothing too difficult in this life that the word does not speak to. I've got some examples for you, right? He says, he says that I hate every false way. He says that, that if we study it and we apply it to our lives, we can face any situation. So here, are you struggling with patience? God's word will help you with that. Hebrews 10, 36, it says, you need to preserve, persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. You feeling hopeless, maybe? A lot of us feel hopeless, especially in today's time, in today's age. God's word speaks directly to it. This is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, it's Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Right? So if you're hopeless, if you feel hopeless, hold on to your faith. Hold on to God's word because he is faithful and he will guide you and he will carry you through. Are you anxious? Don't raise your hands because everyone's going to raise their hand. Right? We all have something to be anxious about. God's word will help you. God's word in Isaiah 41 in Isaiah 41:10 says, "So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There is nothing. There is no struggle in this world that, that you can feel that this word is not going to speak to. I promise that. And if we devour it and if we devote our lives to it, it will guide us through every difficulty we ever face. So we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So let's keep Let's keep reading. So let's get back into Psalm 119, verse 105. You've heard this verse. You know this one. Everyone's heard this one. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. Man, I love that. Verse 106, I have solemnly sworn to keep your righteous judgments. I am severely afflicted, Lord. Give me life according to your word. Lord, please accept my free will offering of praise and teach me your judgments. My life is constantly in danger, yet I do not forget your instruction. The wicked have set a trap before me, but I have wondered, I have not wondered from your precepts. I have your decrees as a heritage forever. Indeed, they are the joy of my heart. I am resolved to obey your statutes to the very end. This first verse, Psalm 119:105. We should all write it out somewhere we see it every single day because we need to be reminded of it every single day. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. God's word should quite literally, literally guide every step you take. Any lamp can light your path, right? Any ideology that we have can guide your way. But only when we study God's word, only when we depend on the light that God provides, will it light our path in such a way that we will see the world through the lens of scripture. That we will see the world so that we know how we ought to live, how we ought to act, what we ought to do. Only when we let God's word light our path, not the world's ideologies and thoughts, but when we let God's word light our path, then we will see the steps that we should take and we will see the steps that we should avoid. God's word lights our path in such a way that we understand how we are to follow him. And we only, only when, when, we, when we study his word, when we meditate on his word, when we have his word in our heart so that the Holy Spirit can bring it to mind, only when we do that will his, will his light guide our path so that we know which steps to take. The light that God's lamp provides, it's not just some convenient guidance for you. It's not some convenient guidance for, for which job you should take, or it's not some convenient guidance for maybe where you should put your investments or, or whatever else. God's word, it, it's, it's truth that guides us toward moral choices that, that will draw us closer to the Lord and draw us closer to Christ's likeness. It's not just something that, that helps us make decisions it's something that changes us from the inside out. It's something that when people look at us, they tell, they can tell 
that we are taking in God's word because we truly look more like Jesus. When we, when we read the word and we study the word and we meditate on it and we apply it to our lives and we allow the Holy Spirit to change us because of what God has given to us. No matter what life has, uh, can throw at us, we are called to remember what the Lord says. It says, the wicked have set a trap before me, but I have not wandered from your precepts. No matter what the wicked throw before you, no matter what in life comes up that may seem really difficult, we are called to never wander from his precepts, to always remain steadfast in the word of God. God's word is something that we can always lean on. Always, no matter what, whether you are three or 93 or anywhere in between, this word is useful and it is good and it has something for each of us. This word, it guides us, it tells us how to live our lives. And when, when literally everything else in the world lets you down, his word remains. When everything else in the world seems bleak and hopeless and painful, God's word is the same as it always has been. And it will always guide you to life. You can always find joy in it. I have your decrees as my heritage forever. As my heritage forever, whether I'm three or 93, I have your decrees as my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. They are the joy of my heart. When, when the world is difficult and things are tough, God's word can be the joy of our heart. And so we have closely looked at three sections of this acrostic poem in Hebrews, or I'm sorry, in Psalm 119. And, and, and it gives us such a clear picture as to what God's word is and how we as followers of Christ should respond to his word. And now what I want to do is I want to get very, very applicable. I want to get to a point here where, where the rubber meets the road of the sermon. This is where we start to understand how can we use God's word. And, and here's the one point. This is the main point of the message. It's really, really simple. If you are a follower of Christ, read your Bible. Study your Bible. Listen to the word of God because he wants to talk to you. He wants to communicate to you. He wants to guide your path. Let him. If you are a follower of Christ, read your Bible. It's that simple. That's the point of the message. If you are a follower of Christ, study his words. Meditate on them day and night. And the reason that I'm so passionate about this and the reason that, that it's so important for us to, to drill this home, the point, read your Bible. The reason it's so important is because it's not true for many of us. Many Christians don't read their Bibles literally almost ever. Barna is a, a research group that does different studies in, in the Christian world. And, and in their 2020 survey, they do a survey every year on Bible usage and, and people's opinions of the Bible. And 2020 is the most recent one they have published. It says this, just over one third. And, and when it says U.S. adults, it's talking about professing Christians. Just over one third of U.S. adults, 34 percent, read the Bible once a week or more. While half, 50 percent, read the Bible less than twice a year. And that includes never. 34 percent of professing Christians read their Bible at only once a week, if that. Half never read it. How are we going to claim to follow Christ but never listen to him? What kind of a marriage would I have if I went home to my wife every day and never listened to a word she said? What kind of a marriage would I have if I literally ignored every single thing she ever said to me? Just didn't listen. She wants to talk to me, but I say, no, nope, I don't want to hear from you. What kind of a marriage would that be? What kind of a Christian life is it if we look at God and say, no, I don't want this. I don't want to hear from you. That is, that's what we're doing when we choose not to study the word. We're saying, God, I don't want to hear from you. You've got a lot of great things for me, but I don't care. I don't want it. That's what we're doing when we don't study. Another research group called the Center for Bible Excellence, they found this. This is, this is why it's important for you to know that, that only
only, uh, thir- and this is the highest that people read the Bible in their study. 34% read the Bible once a week or more. That's, that's the highest. There's nothing saying that, you know, so many percent read it five times a week or whatever else. Uh, 34% read it more than once a week or at least once a week. And here's another, another study, and, and this is why that other statistic is so important. The other study from the Center for Bible Excellence says there is no significantly, statistically significant difference between those who read the Bible one to three times a day and those who never read it. Or one to three times a week, I'm sorry. And so if you're only reading your Bible one to three times a week, there is no difference in if you just never read it. Statistically, there's no change in your life. Christians, Christians who read their Bibles one to three times a week or look exactly the same as those who never read their Bible. And so if you're only reading it one, two, three times a week, God's word is not, it's not impacting you. It's not getting to the deepest recesses of our souls so that we may go and do God's work. D.L. Moody, a scholar, thinking about that statistic uh, that we read, he said this, a man can no more take in a supply of grace for the future than he can eat enough for the next six months. Or take sufficient air into his lungs at one time to sustain life for a week. We must draw upon God's boundless store of grace from day to day as we need it. What's D.L. Moody saying? He's saying I, you can't eat enough in one day to make it for the next six months. It doesn't work like that. You can't take one big breath in and be good and not need to breathe for the next week. It doesn't work like that. You have to continually eat. You have to continually breathe or you're going to die. Christian, you have to continually hear from God or you are going to fall in the world. You have to continually be in the Bible hearing what the Father has for you or you're not going to make it. You can't just read this once a year and think, oh, that's good enough. No, we have to hear from God every single day. So the question is how? What do we do? How do we read it? And it's not just that we read it, we study it, right? And we're going to talk about that. But so this, 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 is, this is it. This is what, what we need to, to pay attention and, and, and do this. We have to study the Bible. And so this is where we're getting to the point in the sermon where if you don't take notes, maybe it's time to take some here and, and take these tips and go home and read your Bible. Before you even start to, to, to start deciding you're going to read your Bible, there's one thing that you have to do. You have to decide. You have to decide on a time, a place, and a plan. A time, a place, and a plan every day. So there's going to be a specific time you read the Bible. I read my Bible about 6 o'clock every morning. I get up at 5 and about 6 every morning I'm reading the Bible. And I do it in the same place every day in the office at my house. I set it at my desk. And I have a plan. I read one chapter a day. Right now I'm going through the book of John. I read a chapter and I study it and I take notes. And you need to do the same thing. You need a time, a place, and a plan. My other, my next tip. So, so again, here we're just we're just going through some some real applicable ways to get the word into your life. My next tip, and and I would argue that this is kind of scriptural, but it doesn't specifically say it in the Bible, but we see it over and over from many different people, especially in the Old Testament. Do it first thing in the morning. Don't wait until you're going to bed to read your Bible. If you're waiting until you're going to bed, you're, first of all, you're gonna fall asleep. Like you're not gonna. It's not gonna work. You all know that. We've all tried it. Next is, if we read our Bible in the morning, we can draw upon what we read throughout the day. If we read our Bible at night, you're not sinning much while you sleep. right? You're not tempted much while you sleep. But if we read it first thing in the morning, as we're tempted throughout the day, we have God's word to draw upon. If, if that sounds difficult, hey, I'm so busy in the mornings. Wake up 30 minutes earlier. You get up at 6, wake up at 5.30. Go read your Bible. If you're truly serious about wanting to hear from God, get up 30 minutes earlier and go read your Bible. Another benefit of reading in the morning, kids are still asleep, probably. Your, your spouse may even still be asleep. Whatever distractions you have are probably gone at that time in the morning. You can focus on the Word throughout the day. You won't be drowsy and sleepy. You'll be able to really focus on God's Word. Uh, one thing, and I don't necessarily do this anymore. I used to do this when I was trying to establish a habit. I have this habit established now, and so I'm not as worried about it. But uh, I used to really stick true to a saying, really simple, no Bible, no breakfast. If you haven't read your Bible, don't eat food. You're going to be hungry. So maybe use that. Say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to eat breakfast until I read my Bible. No Bible, no breakfast. So the next thing, don't just study. Or I'm sorry, don't just read the word. Study it. Meditate on it. Ask 
questions of it. Uh, I, I've got some questions that I use and that have, have, have come to me, and I'm going to have a slide pop up here uh, that's going to help you out with this. So these are three really, really great applicable questions that are going to help you not just read the Bible, but study the Bible. What does it say about God? When I'm reading it, what is it telling me about God? Again, this whole book, it's a story pointing to Jesus. It's a story about God. What does this passage that I'm reading say about God? What does it say about me? What does it say about humanity? What does it say about sin? What does it say about how I should respond to God? And last thing, what do I need to do about it? When I'm reading and I'm studying, instead of just reading, ask these questions. Say, what is this teaching me? What can I learn about God from this word? What can I learn about me from this word? And what can I do different after I read this word uh, that's going to change my life and that's going to help me grow to be more like Christ? Again, I've said this once already, and I'll say it again. I understand that this is not the easiest book in the world to understand, that there's a lot in there. It's, it can be hard. It can be difficult. But the great thing is, guys, we live in 2023. There is so many awesome resources that are so helpful for you. And so as we read it, get something to help you understand it. I've got some examples here. And so this is one of the best study resources for reading and studying the Bible, the ESV Study Bible. It doesn't have to be the ESV study Bible, but almost every translation has a study Bible. In the study Bible, it, you have the scripture on top, and on the bottom are study notes. And these notes help you understand context. They help you tie what's up here back to somewhere else or forward to somewhere else in scripture. And so these notes are invaluable. They truly help you understand the Bible better. Get yourself a Bible commentary. This looks like a lot, and it is, but this is one of the best resources I own. I've got a, you can ask my wife, I've got way too many books. I've got a bookshelf full of Bibles and Bible commentaries and different books, but this is amazing. It's the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It's a two-volume set. This is the New Testament. This is the Old Testament. As you're studying the Bible, as you're reading, have your Bible open and have this right next to it and say, I don't have any idea what I just read. This is going to help you understand that. There's many other commentaries out there, many other great resources. Look on the internet. Go to gotquestions.org. I use this as I study. Richie uses it. I know a bunch of great, great uh, pastors and speakers and scholars who use it. There are so many resources on that website that are going to be really, really helpful to you as you try to understand God's word. Finally, ask friends. Like, ask people who you know study the word. Like, if you don't get something, Text someone and ask. Text me and ask. I'll, I'll try to help you understand it. I'll try to understand it myself. Right? There are many ways that we can better understand what's in this word. Uh, God has given us resources, uh, given us ways that we can uh, understand his word better. Okay, the next thing. So don't just read it. Study it. And, and as you study it, journal. This has been, I, I, I can't stress this enough. This has been the most beneficial thing for me personally as I have learn to study God's word is journaling. As I read the Bible, I am writing many different things. I'm writing scripture out. There's a verse that really clicked, really stuck with me. Write it down. There's something that I, I learn. Write it down. I write a reflection of what I just learned down. There's something that I read in this book that I know I need to apply to my life. Write it down. There's prayers. Often my journal is probably about half study notes, half prayer. Write a prayer out. Write it in your journal as you study, and it will help you synthesize the Word of God and apply it to your life. Write out confessions. God's Word will convict you. Write those things out. As you read the Bible, write it out. And the last tip, I've got one more tip, and we're almost done. Memorize God's Word. Write it on your heart. And I will be the first in this room to confess I'm horrible about this. I try and I fail, and it's not because God doesn't is not faithful and won't help me to do it. It's because it's a difficult task. It's difficult to memorize God's word, and, and I have failed at this over and over, And but we have to, I have to, you have to memorize God's word. The word of God is a lamp to our feet, but that lamp doesn't do much good if there's no oil in it. That lamp's not going to light my path if I don't know what the lamp's saying. I have to have my heart filled with God's word. We must retain God's word. Use note cards, write verses out, carry them around with you. When you're at lunch at work, pop a few out and look at them. There's apps, there's great apps out there. Uh, a few that I know of, one called Remember Me, 
one called Verses, another called Versify. Just Google apps to help me memorize the Bible. There's awesome, awesome resources out there. Psalm 119.11, we didn't read this verse as we studied Psalm 119, but this is one of the best verses in that entire psalm, in my opinion. It says, I have stored your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we have God's word written on our heart, it helps us to face temptation. It helps us to live life in a way that we can honor God. When we have God's word written on our hearts, we are able to, to face temptation and not sin. We are able to face all the difficulties in the world and see the joy of Jesus. Jesus had scriptures written on his heart. And when Satan tempted him, he said, no, no, no. God's word says this. And I'm going to follow God's word. So as we, as we wrap it up here, I've got uh, something. If you are a believer in this room, I've got something for you. And it's simply this. Read your Bible. Study the word of God. God wants to speak to you. God wants to communicate with you. Let him. This is how he communicates with us. If you are a follower of Christ, listen to the Father. Open your heart and spend time with him. There is nothing more important than hearing from your Father. Nothing in this world. No distractions is more important. You're not too busy. You watch, look at the screen time on your phone. How much Netflix do you watch? You're not too busy. Read your Bible so that you can become more like Christ, so that we can be more like him. The word should not be just a guiding force in our life. It's the guiding force. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness. God's word is, is beneficial in every area of your life. If you study your Bible, and, and, and even just life in general, and when you're doing that, if it seems like God is distant, uh, I understand that. I've been there. Pray. Ask God. Ask him to help you to, to focus and to study his word. In 1 Samuel 3.21, uh, Samuel is, is, uh, is depending on, the God, on God to uh, lead Israel because Israel is all kinds of messed up. And, and it says in verse uh, 21 of chapter 3, The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh because there he revealed himself to Samuel by his word. Earlier, Samuel was praying to God, God, reveal yourself. And what does it say? The Lord continued to appear. And so if you study his word and, and it seems unfruitful, pray, say, God, please show me what I can learn from you, how I can change my life, be more like you from this word. If you're an unbeliever in the room, I have something for you as well. This book, I want you to know, it contains the answer to every problem. It contains the answer to every question you have. It contains joy that you can find nowhere else. It, it may not seem like that right now, because when you see it, it's a bunch of words on a page. But when we surrender our life to Jesus, when we get the Holy Spirit, he Will, he will take what seems like just a bunch of words and he will bring them to life and he will show you to use them to guide every step of your life. And so if you haven't given your faith to Christ or your life to Christ, if you haven't, if you haven't professed faith in him, uh, do that. Trust in Jesus. Trust that, that, that the world is all kinds of screwed up and we are too, but, but God gave us a way to him and that is Jesus. And if we trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit enters our life, and this word will guide you, and it will change your life. I promise you this, believer and unbeliever, this is the last thing I have. I promise you this. This is a, 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 a and, and, and I'll, I'll promise you, if, if what I say doesn't come, if you do it and it doesn't come true, I'll give you my next paycheck. I promise you that. If you will study the word of God every day, starting today, for the next 365 days, you will be different next year. Your life will change. You will look more like Christ. If you study this word and you apply it to your life, you will be different. You will look more like Christ. And that's the goal, right? We are training up to be more like Christ. So I'm going to pray here in just a moment. If you in this room don't know Christ and you want to understand more what it means to learn to know him, let me know afterwards. Let Richie know afterwards. Find somebody that you trust and let them know afterwards, and we'll walk you through that decision. 
Uh, after I pray, we're going to show a video. Uh, today is a special day, and we're going to honor our Pregnancy Resource Center in Lawton. And then Lori Williams is going to come up and talk about it for just a moment. And then you guys uh, will be dismissed for the day. Father, God, I thank you for your word. It is unbelievable how faithful you are in your word. It's unbelievable how in this word you guide us through every situation in life. How we can just open this Bible and find the answer to every problem we have ever, have ever had. God, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that the believers in this room would devote their lives to following you, devote their lives to reading this word so that they may become more like you. Father, if there's anyone in this room who hasn't trusted in you, God, I pray that they would do that today. I pray that they would come to know you. They would come to know that you are better than anything else in this world, and they would give their life to you in Jesus. And you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would enlighten these texts so that their lives would be guided by your word. Father, help us all to depend on your word today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.